Well, the Zags need this one in a major way tonight. And San Francisco gave them a nice gift by playing this one at the Chase Center, where a pro Gonzaga crowd could turn the tides in Mark Few's favor. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Happy Thursday, happy game day, and welcome in to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by FanDuel. Folks, make every moment more. Right now, new customers who join today, you'll get $150 in bonus bets if your first bet of $5 or more is a win. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on today to get started. Well, today is a deep dive into this game against San Francisco. We're going to close out the show talking about the game's location, talking a little bit about the net rankings. We're also going to talk about my five keys to a Gonzaga victory against the Dons. Before we get to that, though, we're just going to introduce this team, talk about what happened last time they played, talk about what has happened since then, kind of get everybody ready to go for what is in a very, very exciting game very critical game for Gonzaga and for San Francisco, Thursday night, February 29th, 8 p.m. Pacific time. I'm going to shout out some of my New York listeners. I've had a few conversations with some of you all, and I know it's a late, late tip for this game tonight, especially out on the East Coast. So hang in there, have some extra coffee. Uh, it's going to be a late one, but it's going to be a fun one. The game will be on ESPN2. And of course, played at the Chase Center. We're going to get more into that. I know that has been a very hot topic since it was announced the game was going to be at the Chase Center. And now when we're in this position where Gonzaga and San Francisco are jockeying for second place in the WCC, uh, jockeying to get that second or that uh, double buy in the WCC tournament, it feels like this game has some really high stakes to it. And that kind of has exacerbated the conversation around where this game is being played. We'll get into more of that later, but... I want to remind you what happened the last time these two teams played. It was a five-point victory for Gonzaga at home, and the game wasn't really that close. It was a, a one-point lead at halftime for San Francisco. Gonzaga then came back in the second half, picked up a pretty decent lead, and really felt like they were going to kind of coast to an 8, 10, 12-point victory somewhere in there. And what happened is Coach Chris, Ger Chris Gerlison for San Francisco started fouling Gonzaga at like the two-and-a-half-minute mark, and it worked. They were putting on a huge press, full court press, trying to prevent Gonzaga from getting the ball in comfortably. A lot of times Gonzaga had to inbound the ball to somebody who wasn't super comfortable at the free throw line. A lot of the time it was Anton Watson. That player would miss free throws. USF would come down, score, and suddenly in like a 90-second span, this game went from in the bag for Gonzaga to they might lose. And they managed to secure it in part because Graham E.K. was excellent at the free throw line, especially in clutch situations. Same story for Ben Gregg, who went 4-4 four four from the free throw line in that game. That was a critical piece. But Gonzaga's lack of free throw shooting was a significant problem at the end of that game. They went 22 of 34, which is about 65% for the contest. But it was another one of those games, too, where a situation that has been resolved in a bigger way lately but was a big issue for Gonzaga earlier in the year was the lack of bench production. And this was a really kind of prominent example of that for Gonzaga this year. All five of Gonzaga's starters in this game, and this was after they had made the switch to have Ben Gregg in the starting lineup. All five of Gonzaga starters were in double figures in this game. The bench combined to score just four points. All four of those points were scored by Dusty Stromer. This was Braden Huff's worst game, least productive game that we've seen from him in a Gonzaga uniform. And we'll get into the keys to the game a little bit later, but him not playing this poorly is definitely going to be a key. Huff had, he played seven minutes. He went 0 of 5 from the field, got five shots up in seven minutes, which is what we love about Braden Huff. He's willing to take shots. He's willing to, as soon as he gets into the game, he wants to score right away. But 0 of 5 in seven minutes. He finished with four rebounds. He also had two fouls. He was getting pushed around. He couldn't score. It was just a, an ugly game from Braden Huff. Dusty Stromer had just the four points. Junio played 
didn't even register as a full minute uh, of action in that game. I think he came in late in the first half just to give somebody a bit of a spell. That was it. That was it for Gonzaga. Uh, Krinovich was still injured at that time. He has, of course, since now been uh, a member of, sort of a member of the rotation, at least somebody who plays on a regular basis. But the starters were great. Graham E.K., 22-7 and seven in that game, 10-11 of 11 from the free throw line. That was where he really thrived in that one. Nembhard had 13-6. and six. Hickman had 11 points and two steals. Anton Watson had 15 points, seven boards, three assists, and three steals. He was 6-8 of eight from the field. Every part of Anton Watson's line looks incredible, except for the 3-9 of nine from the free throw line, a glaring problem for Anton for his entire collegiate career, but it really almost cost the, game, the Zags a game in that one. And then Ben Gregg, 12 and five in that game, four of four from the free throw line. That was his biggest and most important contribution to Gonzaga in that one. Uh, USF went 11 of 33 from three and they out-rebounded the Zags by nine, 41 to 32 was, his, was their line in that one. Marcus Williams, 19 points and seven rebounds, also had three assists. Jonathan Mobo didn't do much, and we're going to talk about that more in the keys to the game. He had eight points. He did have 11 boards and four assists on four of six shooting, but he committed a lot of fouls, uh, and that ultimately kept him off the floor for longer than I'm sure Chris Gerlison would have wanted. Uh, both teams have been fantastic since that game. That was a big turnaround point for Gonzaga. I think the, the, the real turnaround was the next game when they didn't play very well against Pacific. They ultimately won that game against Pacific by, I think, 12, but did not look pretty at all in the first half. And since then, they have been much, much, much better uh, for Gonzaga. Their only loss is to St. Mary's uh, in that stretch. They obviously have the wins uh, over LMU. They have wins over Portland. They have the big, huge monster win over Kentucky. They have last weekend's win over Santa Clara. For San Francisco, similar situation. They are 7-1 seven, seven and one since that game. Their loss was to St. Mary's. It was a four-point loss at St. Mary's, 70-66. to 66. Uh, No Joshua Jefferson for St. Mary's. This was his first full game being out uh, for the Gales. Uh, Mitchell Saxon, monster game against, uh, against San Francisco. He had 20 and 13 on 6 of 11 shooting. Alex Dukas had 18. Aid Mahaney had 12. Jonathan Mobo also quiet in that one offensively. Six points, six boards, and five assists. He was three of seven from the field, and he fouled out after only playing 25 minutes. Otherwise, USF seven have won seven of the last eight. Blowout wins over Portland, San Diego at LMU. Big win against Pepperdine at home. They beat Pacific at home as well, but only by six points. They beat Pepperdine on the road, also only by six points. And they beat Santa Clara by just one at home. San, San Francisco has been right with Gonzaga for second place in this conference. And Gonzaga has played some too close for comfort games, but so has San Francisco. This is a team that they've played down to Pacific twice. They went into overtime the first time they played Pacific, and they only beat them by six the second time. Pacific is very bad, and San Francisco didn't play particularly well against them either time that they played them. Not to say San Francisco isn't very good. They are absolutely very good. 63rd at Ken Palm right now. Adjusted defensive efficiency has them 42nd. They're a borderline top 40 defensive team. I think they were around top 25 when Gonzaga played them, so that has dipped a little bit as the season has gone on, but they are a very efficient offensive team. Their e-field goal percentage is 15th in the country, according to Ken Palm. Their two-point field goal percentage is 58.2. According to Ken Palm, that is second in the country. They are one of the most efficient scoring teams outside of the three-point shot where they are much less consistent, although they do have some good three-point shooters on the roster as well. Their star is, of course, Jonathan Mobo. He's averaging a double-double this season, 15 and 10, also averaging about three and a half assists. And we're going to talk a lot more about him and what Gonzaga needs to do to ensure a victory on Thursday because it's going to start on the block. It's going to start with the rebounding. It's going to start with the Jonathan Mobo versus Graham E.K. battle. And we're going to get into all of that after a word from today's sponsor, eBay Motors. Folks, passion, drive, patience. That's what brings home the winning trophy. And it's also what helps keep your ride or die alive. And eBay Motors has everything that you need to maintain your vehicle and Level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. And with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you are looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or you get your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that W. 
Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, and eBay's guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. All right, folks, segment two, still any patents, still Locked On Zags podcast, and we're still getting you ready for Thursday night's game between the Zags and the Dons at the Chase Center at 8 p.m. on ESPN2. Going to go through my five keys to victory here. And for those of you who are new listeners to the show, haven't listened to very many of these game preview episodes, the five keys to victory for certain opponents are typically laid out as, here's what I'm going to be looking for. We don't necessarily need these five things to happen to beat Pacific or Mississippi Valley State or Jackson State or whomever it may be. For some games, it is like this is what they need to do to win. And that's how we're going to handle it for the Gonzaga against San Francisco because the Dons are more than capable of beating Gonzaga, even in a not as friendly home environment as they were hoping for. Again, a topic we'll get to a little bit later, but this is a very good Dons team. And the for Gonzaga to win, it's going to start with the boards. I talked to Coach Chris Gerlison before the last game that Gonzaga and San Francisco played, and one of the things he talked about quite a bit was figuring out how to make sure that Gonzaga – to make sure that San Francisco gets more rebounds. It was a big thing for him. Is like Gonzaga is always plus 10 on the glass, plus five on the glass, plus whatever on the glass. We need to find a way to make sure that we out-rebound them. And he executed that. He told me that he was going to find a way to get more rebounds than Gonzaga, and his team did it. They got nine more rebounds than Gonzaga, 41 to 32. Their starting center is 6'8", and they out-rebounded Gonzaga in that game. This was after the move to make Ben Gregg a starter as well. That is a big problem for Gonzaga. It was a reason, a factor for why that game was close enough that they were able to foul at the end of the game and why they were able to get that game to a really close spot before Gonzaga finally managed to put it away in the in the closing seconds. The Dons had 13 offensive rebounds last time out. Gonzaga had six. Second chance points are going to be a big story in this game. It is going to be a determining factor between these two teams is who gets more second chance points, who prevents the other team from getting second chance points, forces them to get a lot of one and done opportunities. San Francisco is very efficient around the rim. You can't give them second chance opportunities. Same, San Francisco is thinking the same thing about Gonzaga. Gonzaga is a great scoring team, highly efficient offensive team, especially as of late. You can't let this team get more offensive rebounds. you got to keep them one and done. So that is going to be a big, big part of this game is which team can get more offensive rebounds, which team can out rebound the other team and kind of win that battle on the board. Because I think that's going to be something that really helps determine the winner in this one. Key number two, we're sticking with the front court. We're sticking with the guys down low because the key here is Graham EK needs to be the better player than Jonathan mobile. It is in some ways a battle between the two top candidates for the WCC player of the year. St. Mary's is potentially going to get the WCC player of the year because they are the best team in the conference. Whether that goes to Augustus Marcellonis or Aiden Mahaney or Mitchell Saxon, I don't know. But the two best players in the conference right now, in my opinion, statistically and impacting their team are Grammy K and Jonathan Mobo. And it is a big storyline who outdoes who in this game. And something that I've noticed, Jonathan Mobo has a tendency to defer in big games. Last time he played Gonzaga, he had just eight points. He was four of six from the field, but he didn't look to take his shots. It's kind of like the conversation that Mark Few eventually had to have with Graham E.K. and say, look, you need to demand the basketball. You need to be assertive and you need to go to work when you get the ball. I don't know if that conversation is happening with San Francisco, if they want it to happen, if it's what they're asking or not. I don't know. I'm not privy to all of that, but it sure seems like Mobo doesn't look for his shot as often in those bigger games, whether it's because he doesn't think the matchup favors him or not. I don't know. But eight points on four of six against the Zags last time out. Last week against St. Mary's, he had just six points on three of seven shooting. The first time against St. Mary's, he had 11 points, better, but he was also only three of five. He converted at the free throw line, which got him some extra points. But your best player taking five shots against St. Mary's, I know their pace makes it so those numbers always look a little wonky, but that's still, you can't have just five shots for your best player against the best team in the conference. You just can't do it. Back early in the season, he had 10 points on five of six shooting against Boise State, a game that USF narrowly lost. This was the third game of the year. They may not have known exactly what they had in Mobo, but... He also had just four points against Vanderbilt. He only had four points on two of nine shooting against Seattle U. Not a particularly great team there. Mobo has not been that consistent. And I think 
the fact that he didn't look for his shots and it kind of put a lot more pressure on Marcus Williams and um, to a lesser extent, Mike Sheriff Johns, who didn't have a great game against Gonzaga last time out either. Malik Thomas uh, also like those guys had to take a lot more shots for San Francisco in that game against Gonzaga. And while they had pretty decent games, I think Mobo not being as willing to go to work and challenge Graham EK and, and do that, I think c- contributed to their loss. Uh, and I think the foul thing is a huge storyline too. Mobo gets in foul trouble pretty regularly. It's a big, it's probably his biggest issue as a basketball player right now is that he takes himself out of games because of that foul trouble. Again, Mitchell Saxon had 20 and 13, primarily from dominating at the free throw line. Graham E.K. was 10 of 11. The last time these two teams played from the free throw line, get Mobo in foul trouble, get him on the bench, convert from the free throw line, and you should be able to take care of business here. Key number three is a big game from the bench. Like we mentioned, Four points from the bench last time these two teams played, all coming from Dusty Stromer. Guess what? Dusty Stromer's been a lot better even since then, quite a bit better. He's playing some of the best basketball we've seen from him. Looks a a lot like the guy we saw at the very beginning of the year, and then he's kind of faded a bit, and his role adjusted, and he adjusted to it, and now he's playing great. They're going to need him. I bet there's going to be some Dusty Stromer fans in the house, some family in the house at the Chase Center. Uh, Near, somewhat near his hometown in California. I think Dusty's going to need to have a big game here, and I think they're going to be expecting him to play a big role. I'm sure Mark Few is ready for him to come out and bring that energy off the bench, space the floor, cause some problems defensively, get some takeaways, knock the ball loose a few times, whatever it may be. Things that we know Dusty Stromer is very good at, a really good rebounding guard. Again, we go back to that first key. His ability to keep Sheriff Jones off the boards, Malik Thomas off the boards, uh, the other guards for uh, for San Francisco off the boards and, and get fighting for those defensive rebounds, that's going to be vital. He's also a great offensive rebounder. A couple tip backs every single game. Get, to, get two or three of those in this one. That's a huge deflating feeling for San Francisco and a huge momentum swing for Gonzaga. Braden Huff, same thing. He was just a non-factor in this game last time. I think it's still going to come down to Graham E.K. and Anton Watson in a major way in this one, Ben Gregg to an extent as well. But Braden Huff being able to come into this game, score some points, grab some rebounds. He's not going to be great defensively, but maybe they won't attack him. They should. They should probably throw Mobo on the block, give him the basketball, and make him go right at Braden Huff and prove that Braden can stop him. And if they do that and it works a few times, maybe – Braden Huff doesn't get to play as much in this game. Like that might be a way that they can neutralize him. But if they don't do that, or if Huff can come in, get a few block shots, muscle mobile for the rebounds and score on him or get him to foul him back. If Huff can get to the free throw line and draw some contact on mobile, that's a really big boost for Gonzaga. So those two guys in particular, are very critical in my mind in this game. Uh, Luka Krinovich as well, mostly because Nolan Hickman and Ryan Nembard played full 40 last time against San Francisco, and then the team looked sloppy two days later against Pacific. If we have to play a full 40 with Nemhard and Hickman and Watson to potentially and don't have any – any, they don't get any breaks, they can't come out sloppy this Saturday because you come out sloppy in the first half against Pacific, you still win by 12. You come out sloppy in Moraga, you're buried in the first half. That is not an option for Gonzaga. So hopefully Krinovich can give some spells in the first half and the second half allow Hickman and Nemhard to play closer to 36, 37 minutes, get some longer breaks, potentially have fresher legs for Saturday's game against the Gales. Key number four, we kind of already touched on it, convert at the free throw line. Zags were 22 of 34 last time, 65%. USF fouls a ton, and getting Mobo in foul trouble is a big key. If he has to sit for large chunks of this game because he is in foul trouble, that's a massive benefit for Gonzaga. But you also should convert the dang shots at the free throw line. Since this game, Gonzaga has shot 78.6% from the free throw line. I knew it was good when I started to look this up. I was like, I bet this is going to be a really big number because it feels like they have been lights out from the charity stripe since that San Francisco game. I was not expecting it to be about 79%. That is ridiculous. Incredibly efficient. Gonzaga needs to knock down their free throws in this game. If they shot 79% instead of 65% against San Francisco, they'd have won that game by like 14 or 15. I mean, the whole strategy would have changed, obviously, but that was a a big part of that game. And the fact that Zags have been so much better since then at the free throw line is a big confidence boost coming into this game as long as they can continue that trend. And then key number five, and we're going to get much more into this, take advantage of the potential pro Zags crowd. Get going early. Get out in transition. Get a big three-pointer early. 
Make that crowd go crazy. Make sure San Francisco knows in the first four minutes of this game, when the first media timeout rolls around, that that crowd is not there to root for them. Like that should be something that should be known. And that's not just on the crowd. The Zags got to give them something to cheer for. You come out, you get a steal and a bucket on the first possession of the game, and that place goes crazy. That sends the message. That sends the message. Where you're playing is not friendly for you, despite being down the road. There are going to be 1,200 San Francisco students at this game. And if they're, any, if they're doing their job, it's going to be loud for San Francisco when they do well. But if the rest of that crowd is 60, 70, 75, 80% Gonzaga fans, it needs to be bumping. And part of that's on the crowd, but again, part of that's on the Zags to give them something to cheer for early in this game and send that message that you're not home, you're in our house. Well, we're going to speak about that crowd. We're going to speak about this game being played at the Chase Center. We're also going to have some thoughts on the net rankings. All of that coming up. After a word from today's sponsor, FanDuel. Folks, get buckets with your first bet on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Because right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's $150 straight to your pocket if your bet wins. You can bet on all your favorite Zags in the NBA players and your favorite teams with quick bets, live same game parlays, exclusive props, and more. And FanDuel, as I'm recording this, currently has Gonzaga four and a half point favorites at the Chase Center. It's not exactly a true road game. Gonzaga, they're tough. They, they like to play around with that line, but they won by five last time. I think there's a real chance they win by more than five this time. If you agree, visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and shoot your shot. FanDuel is the official sportsbook partner of the NBA. All right, folks, closing out the show. Talking about the game location, not Typically something that we're having large conversations about, but this has been a big topic. This week, it's been a big topic since it was announced. It has just been a topic because Gonzaga is not playing San Francisco at War Memorial. They're home on campus arena. If you've not been to War Memorial, by the way, one of my favorite places It is right in the heart of San Francisco's campus. Too few basketball arenas are right on the heart of campus. I get that it's a difficult thing to change once your campus has already been established. And certainly for campuses that are in urban areas like San Francisco, I think of Seattle U as well, they would like to do this, but it's difficult because of the location that their campus kind of resides in. But San Francisco is sitting on a gold mine because they have this, and they're they're redoing it, by the way, there's there's gonna be some changes to it, it's gonna look fantastic, but they have this big, beautiful stadium, it's intimate, It's not like the nicest in the world. It's still a WCC stadium, but it is a quality arena right in the middle of campus. The student section or the section goes up like this. It feels like the whole crowd's on top of you. It's a tough place to play. When I was a student at Gonzaga, they played San Francisco four times at War Memorial. They lost every single time. And this was a good era of Gonzaga basketball. Not quite, you know, the era that we're just coming through right now, but it was a good era. And they could not beat San Francisco on the road. And none of those San Francisco teams made the NCAA tournament like San Francisco did two years, two years ago. Like this team probably won't, depending on how this game goes in some ways, but like they're they're in that conversation. They're far more in that conversation than previous San Francisco teams, but they would win at War Memorial because that's a tough place to play. And yet here we are before a massive game, a game that's going to have a significant role in determining who finishes second in the WCC. And remember, the difference between second and third in the WCC standings, not something Gonzaga's had to think about much over the last 25 years, frankly, but the difference right now is a double buy in the WCC tournament. You don't have to play until the semifinals. You only have to play two games. You win the first game, you're in the championship. That's it. That's all you have to do. Yet, if Gonzaga loses this game, there's a possibility that they finish third and then they have to play more games to get into that. They have more opportunities to potentially lose in Las Vegas. They wear themselves out a little bit more. They're more tired by you get to the time you get to the championship game. Like it is a, it's a, a raw deal. And that's why a lot of the teams in WCC don't like the double by format because it really only benefits Gonzaga and St. Mary's. And it's going to change once Washington State and Oregon State join the conference next year. But for right now, it's still in play. And this game matters in a big way because of where they are at currently in the standings. And yet, perhaps the biggest advantage San Francisco could have in this game, it being played on their home floor, 
on their campus, they don't, they don't have it. It's not there. It's not an advantage that they're going to have because of a decision made by the athletic department to play this game at the Chase Center. Somebody asked recently on a mailbag question, why did they do that? Money. Money. Now, there are other reasons. And if you go back and listen to my interview with Coach Chris Gerlison before the last time these two teams played, this was a question we discussed at the end of the show. He gave a very diplomatic answer, a very coach speak answer for those of you who have listened to a lot of press conferences or, or been around coach speak to, you know, as it is, you kind of can read through the lines a little bit. And in this situation, coach Grillison effectively said, we, I was hesitant to play at the chase center. I talked to our athletic department staff, you know, they sold me on the, on it being you know, the environment being cool for the players. Uh, it's good exposure for our brands to be playing in this arena. More people can be blah, 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 whatever. And he said, oh, he's excited about it now. I don't think that he is. I don't want to speak for him specifically. I don't want to like pretend I know exactly what he's thinking. I don't. And so I'm not going to say exactly that, but if I was a coach, I wouldn't be particularly happy about this. Let me put it that way. I would want to play this game where I think I have the absolute best advantage to win, where my players are the most comfortable with the rims and the backboard and the view, where we know the crowd is going to be pro San Francisco. And instead they're playing at the Chase Center where they have played before. They played Minnesota earlier this year at the Chase Center and beat them. Minnesota is not Gonzaga. So that's a different breed. It doesn't, that game didn't matter as much in terms of the seating in the WCC tournament, uh, reputation, just overall quality of win for, for San Francisco. It, it wasn't as important of a game. Now this game is crucial and critical, and they're playing it in a situation that costs them part of their advantage. I don't know if this crowd will be 50 plus percent Gonzaga fans or not. What I do know is that 1,200 students will be there. Tweet from Theo Lawson just before I hit record on this show indicated that there are 1,200 seats reserved for students and that those are full. Also indicated that there have been 50, about 5,300 seats sold up to this point. They're expecting over 6,000 to be sold before the game tips off at 8 p.m. I suspect a huge chunk of those people are Gonzaga fans. Some of them are probably neutral fans, college basketball fans. Maybe they're, you know, kind of want to see the Zags win. Maybe they want to see an upset. Who knows? Um, but I think that the majority who are big fans of a team are going to be Gonzaga fans. And that wouldn't have been the case at War Memorial. Now, what I also want to talk about here is the focus that we put on winning effectively and, and the net system in general. And there's a, there's a longer conversation to be had here for another time, but it, it does feel in some ways like we're so focused on, is this a quad one game? Is this a quad two game? What does this mean? As opposed to just like celebrating college basketball, like there is an element of this, like we're, they're playing at the home of the Golden State Warriors. And if you're a San Francisco player, like that's really cool. You get to go play where Steph Curry plays. You get to go play where Klay Thompson plays, where NBA championships have been won. That's cool for the San Francisco players. That's cool for the Gonzaga players too. Dusty Stromer grows up in California and I've a chance to play at one of the most iconic basketball arenas in the state. Like there is cool elements to this that like people who are so focused on, well, is it a true road game? Is it a neutral game? Is it it's quad two? Like why would San Francisco do this? Like there are things outside of pure wins and losses. And I think, College basketball has become very commercialized. College basketball has become now very financially motivated and incentivized. Uh, and those things aren't like super new. They're not new as of like the last few years, but they're, they're new ish to college basketball. They're obviously expanding in a significant way because of NIL players now getting a cut transfer portal has changed things. Obviously conference realignment has just blown everything up in a major way. But I do think sometimes like the focus so narrowly on the net system and what does this mean? And why would they play here? Like, a step back, I think, is sometimes a little bit necessary of like, there's there's an element of this that is just cool. It's cool for the players. It's cool for the fans. And I think like absolutely trashing San Francisco for doing this, like that's, I think you're missing the point. It's kind of like a forest through the trees situation of like, hey, maybe this isn't a great decision from a pure basketball perspective. And maybe it looks worse because of where they are in the standings and how how significant this game is than it might've looked four months ago when they made the decision. And yes, the decision is probably motivated primarily by money, which kind of feels icky. None of us love that. But at the end of the day, 
these kids get to play in a different arena. And I think they're going to be pretty excited about it. And I think that deserves to be mentioned. That deserves to be a part of this conversation because this conversation is not entirely predicated on what this game means on a spreadsheet. It's not. It's not. Yes, this game is very important. We spent 27 minutes talking about how important this game is. It's not like I'm trying to discount that. I am just saying there is a bigger picture to it. And I think that that is not a part of this conversation that is being had. And I do think that it deserves, in this case, a little bit of airtime here at the end of the show. That is going to wrap it up for us today, though, here on the Locked On Zags podcast. Had a a little bit of conversation I wanted to have about the Big 12 uh, and and some rumors that they're gaming the net system. We will get to that another time uh, because it is kind of a fascinating story and and, and to look at the the flaws of the net system. We'll get to that later. Uh, For now, folks, enjoy the game. It's going to be an absolutely fantastic one. We'll, of course, be back on Friday with a recap of Gonzaga's game against San Francisco, and then we'll get you ready for the big kahuna on Saturday in Moraga against the Gales of St. Mary's. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, as always, go Zags.